Well, we're blessed because we have four different accounts of the story of the historical account of the resurrection. And this morning we're reading from Luke's account and uh, we're focusing on, on what he's saying. And actually we're going to be looking at some verses even past the resurrection account. But we're starting with verse 1 of chapter 24, the very uh, well-known story. It says, but very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. And then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back to the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. And then he went home again, wondering what had happened. This is God's word for us today. Well, this morning, uh, we started out very early, many of you know, uh, whoops, (laughs) in the park. And uh, we had a service that started at 6 o'clock this morning, and one of the highlights of that service is that we construct this cross uh, at the end of the service during our communion time, and that's the cross that we used on Good Friday to pound nails into to remind us that, uh, uh, that, that Jesus went to the cross because each of us deserve to go to the cross, and, uh, it, and it's an ugly cross, actually. Uh, when you look underneath the flowers, it's, it's, a, it's an execution sign, isn't it? It's a sign of ex- ex- execution. But this morning after communion, each person was given a flower, and we saw that the cross became the beautiful symbol of the resurrection that God wants to give for each of us. It occurred to me that today about a billion people or more will be celebrating this particular resurrection this particular on uh, in, in in this in, in this in, uh, on this planet Earth someplace, people will be gathered in church buildings. People will be gathered in parks. People will be gathered under trees. Uh, that is their regular church building, you might say. And in some parts of the world, people will even be even be gathered in secret because it's illegal to do this. And so we ask the question: Why are so many people gathered today? And of course. The answer is, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that the tomb was actually empty, and that lots of eyewitnesses saw him alive, and that they actually, actually saw Jesus. And we believe that Jesus was born, he lived a sinless life, uh, he died on a cross, and now he is risen from the dead, just as he predicted he would. No one else has ever done that before, and for that reason, and that reason alone, we listen to everything Jesus says. That is the reason. Three women came to the tomb with spices expecting to find a body because that's what happens. When de- that's what dead people do. They stay dead. And that's not what happened, though. When they arrived, the stone was rolled away, and in the place of the body, there were angels. And they tell the women, the angels tell the women, he's risen. Why are you searching for the living among the dead? He's risen just like he said he would. And the women rushed back to tell the disciples, and it kind of makes me laugh. And it, probably I would have been one of those two. Luke records the disciples just sort of said, well, that's nonsense. That can't possibly be. That can't possibly be. So Peter and John, we find out, go and look for themselves. And Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples. He recorded it. Mark, <coughs> excuse me, got his information from Peter and he recorded what 
Peter said about the resurrection. John was there, and he recorded it a few years later. And Luke, the one I just read, starts out his gospel by saying he investigated everything so that he could report accurately what had taken place. And in fact, Luke records even a little bit more, an incident that took place after the resurrection, same day, but a little bit later in the afternoon, where a man named Cleopas and perhaps his wife, Mary, uh, are, are, are walking. Uh, they, are, they were there, Mary was there at the crucifixion, and they were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And we learned that Jerusalem to Emmaus is about a seven-mile walk. Um, they're part of the Jesus community, the followers of Jesus. They've been following Jesus over the three years, or at least a part of that. And then now, as they're walking, they're talking about what has taken place during these last couple days. Luke tells us that a stranger comes up and suddenly appears and begins walking with them. And somehow they were kept from recognizing who he is, but Luke tells us who he is. Maybe they're so sad and so preoccupied with the day that they don't notice, or maybe Jesus was wearing a, a hood or something like that that we just don't know, but uh, they don't notice who it is. They know about the empty tomb, but they're skeptical like everybody else is about it. And the stranger, Jesus, asks them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along this path? And Cleopas answers rather abruptly uh, in verse 18. He says, you must be the only one in Jerusalem who has not heard about all the things that have happened in these last few days. Uh, one person I read sort of paraphrased this. Cleopas was in, in effect saying, where have you been living, under a rock or something? I mean, my goodness, and the stranger could have come back with a very snappy comeback and could have said, as a matter of fact, I have been in a rock. I've been in a rock tomb. But he didn't. He held back. <laughs> he has, he's, very, he's very polite about the whole thing. And Jesus says, what things? The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who would come to rescue Israel. And this all happened three days ago. It occurred to me that as the Cleopas was telling his story, um, their story is really our story, isn't it? It's all about that little phrase. We had hoped. We had hoped. We had hoped that life would turn out differently than it seems to be turning out. We had hoped to raise a great family, great kids, live in great health, but the medical report came. We had hoped to have lots more resources saved for retirement, but the recession hit and there was no job. I had hoped to make my marriage work, but it just didn't. I had hoped that I could shake my habit, but ugh, I had hoped that my children would take a different path. That phrase, we had hoped, is a, an amazing phrase, isn't it, that helps us to think about our lives because I think we're all looking for that sort of hope. We're all looking for someone or something that, that in whom we can place our trust for now and for the future. Cleopas and Mary and all the rest of Jesus' followers in general had, had hoped that Jesus was the one, that he was the one that was going to make life come out the way that they wanted it to come out. They had suffered so long at the hands of others and God had told them that he had chosen them to be blessed to be a blessing to the rest of the world. Jesus was their hope. It seemed like things were going so well, but then he ends up on a cross. That did not figure in their plans. 
You see, Rome used crucifixions to, to as the most beautiful, as the most brutal, excuse me, form of execution that there was to, to prove to the people that this guy was no Messiah at all. They used crosses to execute leaders to obliterate the hope of the people because it was such a brutal way to die. And they had done the same to several others before Jesus who had also claimed to be the Messiah. So Cleopas told the stranger, he said, now, he said, now there's even some wild reports about the fact that the tomb is empty. And some women reported that Jesus' body was not there and, and they talked with angels. I can't believe that, can you? We're emotionally exhausted after these three days. I mean, we're, it's been crazy around here. We're just ready to go home. We're ready to go home. We're done. Ever been in that place? Emotionally exhausted, just ready to go home, just to get out of the crazy season you're in? The stranger says something that at first glance seemed really rude, but we know it's Jesus, and so we know it wasn't rude. He said, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe at first, that glance, that sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? I mean, Cleopas and Mary are mentally and physically exhausted. They're just wrung out. And, and that's a harsh word to say. But Jesus was not being harsh. He was not being insulting to them. He's not, he's, he is being a little abrupt to maybe catch their attention. But they're stuck in what they think is the truth. Sometimes we can get stuck in what we think is the truth, and he wants to guide them into what really is the truth. Have you ever been so mind-locked and stubborn on your version of life that you come to find out that, that your story, your perspective, is, turns out to be just flawed? There's just major flaws in it. It's like this story that I read on the internet a while back about a man and woman who'd been married for about 60 years. They'd shared everything. They'd had no secrets except that this little, the, the little woman had a shoebox in the top of her closet that she had cautioned her husband never to open or ask about. And so for all these years, he had never thought about the box. And one day the little old woman got very sick and the doctor said that she would not recover and in trying to sort out their affairs, the, the old man took down the shoebox and, and took it to his wife's bedside. And she agreed that it was time that he should know the contents of it, what was in the box. And so when he opened it, he found two crocheted little dolls and $95,000 in cash. And, 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 and he asked, oh my goodness, what is this about? And so he's, she said to him, when we were married... My grandmother told me that the secret of a happy marriage is never to argue. So she told me that if I ever got it angry with you, I should just keep quiet and crochet a little doll together. The little old man was so moved because he said he had to hold back the tears. Only two precious dolls in the box. Oh my goodness. She had only been angry with him two times in all those years of living and loving together. He almost burst with, into tears of happiness. Honey, he said, that explains the dolls, but where did the $95,000 come from? Oh, that, she said, that's the money I made from selling the dolls for $5 a piece <laughs> at, the, at the local art fair. There's a couple responses to that. One is do the math. <laughs> The second one is, wake up and smell the donuts, fella. <laughs> See, Cleopas and Mary thought that they knew the whole story. They thought they had the, the truth in their mind. But like most of us, we only have a little part of the story. The stranger says, don't you remember what the prophets wrote? Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering into glory? And then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets 
explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see, Jesus was trying to tell them that God has a plan for this world. He's had it for a long forever. That's a long time, isn't it? Forever. And God not only has a plan for the world, he has a plan for you and for me too. But going back to the beginning, there's this thing called sin, this disease called sin, and it's simply people like you and me saying, you know what, Jesus, God, I would rather run my own life. I want to be my own God, and it's as old, literally, as Adam and Eve. You see, God's plan, his story, is that every single one of us would know his love. Every single one of us would have a relationship with him. But sin and selfishness gets in the way. And it causes suffering. It causes people to distrust each other. It causes separation. It causes people to fight and to quarrel. It even causes us to stand by and allow others to starve and senselessly die when we can help. The story of humanity from the very beginning is the story of our brokenness. Our sin causes us to be separated from God's plan. The stranger continues to talk with Cleopas and Mary. God's story, the only real one, is about this one man, the Messiah, who would come and he would suffer more than anyone has ever suffered. And he would be rejected and suffer at the hands of the world. And it would seem like he was being defeated. But instead, his rejection his suffering were not a sign that Rome had defeated Jesus. It was just the opposite. It was the way that God chose to defeat sin that one would suffer for all. It was actually God's plan to forever defeat hopelessness. His resurrection was the last word. But alas, in their exhaustion on this day, the stranger's explanation just didn't seem to connect. It just went right over their head. And now it's getting late, and they're nearing their destination, and, and it says that they begged him, stay the night with us, since it's getting late. So he, Jesus, went home with them. They're saying to him, come and share our hospitality. Come and dine with us. And it happened at mealtime. It happened at mealtime when he broke the bread. The scriptures tell us that maybe they saw the, the nail scars on his wrists. Maybe they saw his face in a different light than they had ever seen it before. Maybe God just opened their eyes at that time. And Luke records this. It says, suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? You see, their eyes were open. They saw the whole story. Jesus' death and resurrection were God's victory over sin and guilt, God's victory over failure and confusion. And the message wasn't that we would never suffer or have problems because of Jesus in fact, they saw their close friend Jesus, someone who didn't do anything wrong, and he certainly suffered. And the whole idea is that they realize now that their problems don't have the last word. Cleopas and Mary had that afternoon started down a path that they thought was a path towards hopelessness. But when they recognized the stranger, they understood the truth. And that's the message of Easter. The message of Easter is the defeat is that defeat will never have the last word. The darkness will never overcome the light. Sin and death, anything this world throws at us, does not get the last word. Because the same Jesus who was crucified did not stay crucified. He was raised up by God from the dead in the greatest act, in the act of power in all of human history. And when he was raised up, every hope of every human heart was raised with him. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that's what they saw in that moment. 
And they were so excited about what happened that, that though it was late, and though they had been ready to call it a day before, Luke writes, within the hour, they were back on their way back to Jerusalem. Remember how long it was from Jerusalem to Emmaus? They had a seven-mile hike waiting for them. But they were ready. They were ready. They were ready to tell, they, though they had been through all the emotions and exhaustion of the crucifixion, and now all the confusion about the re resurrection, now suddenly they have the adrenaline and the energy for this seven-mile hike to take them back to tell the rest of the people, the rest of the story. We're going to leave them in Jerusalem right now, and I want to talk about us this morning. One thing I do know for sure, I've lived enough years to know, and I've watched a lot of other people live, that if you live long enough, life is going to disappoint you. You're going to come to a point where there are disappointments. And maybe your experience is, is that not it's just that it's disappointing, in fact, that just plain stinks right now. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're feeling full of failure, you're, feel, you're feeling pretty alone, feeling pretty beat up. Every day's challenges are hard, that's for sure. But one day, all of us are going to go some, through something that we could have never predicted, something that slams us right in the face that we never saw coming, and it'll knock us for a loop, and sometimes it even causes us to ask the question, God, where are you in all of this? Why did you let this happen? But you know, here's the truth about life. Every one of us has to discern which framework for life we'll live in, which story we're going to follow. And we either do it consciously or we do it unconsciously. We do it by default. Often people live in a story or live in a framework that culture pushes on us. The most common framework today, the most common story that people live for today is probably the success story. It has little derivations, little, little eccentricities back and forth, but social media has heavily influenced it these days. That life is all about money, gaining power and prestige and status, being strong and healthy, and then taking amazing trips and posting them on your social media page. Um, or at least appearing that way. At least appearing that way. And the problem with that choice is that the truth always rears its head someplace in there. And ultimately, one day, another part of the truth is that all of us, this life, for all of us, this life will have an end. All of us are going to die. And even the wealthiest, most well-traveled, most well-chiseled, prestigious bodies will go into the ground just like everyone else's. It's, as one pastor said, the, the death rate is still hovering right at around 100%. <laughs> right around 100%. For some of us, that can be a very, very scary moment. We think it really doesn't matter. That's sometimes the lie that we buy. That it doesn't really matter the framework we have for this life because none of it is really that significant. It's all sort of a big accident, a big cosmic accident. You're here for a while and then poof, you're gone. And what do you do with that? Ultimately, we very commonly, some of us believe that there's no meaning. There's no hope. Reminds me of a close friend, a very close friend of mine who had a wonderful job, uh, a great wife, a, a, a young children, and who was moving up the ladder uh, for a very successful sales career. He had even gone to church most of his life. He was baptized, but really didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And one day as he was driving to a client to make a sale, he just became absolutely overwhelmed. And he pulled his car over to the side of the road. And as he told me, he said what was overwhelming for me, he said the pressure of the next sale, 
the pressure of the bigger quota. He said, constantly just left me feeling inadequate. And where was the next one going to come? And where was the next one? He said, I'm sick and trying, sick and tired of trying to live by the bigger and better way of living. And he said that to God. And he said that to God. And ama amazingly, God met him there on the side of the road that day. Jesus, the, the stranger on the road in our story today from Luke, met him right there and answered him by giving him this incredible peace. And he realized that life was not about bigger and better. Life was about trusting in Jesus. He discovered Jesus' unconditional love. I love you no matter what. I love you no matter what. And what it would really mean to walk with Jesus every single day, not as a stranger, but as your best friend. And so for 2,000 years, Jesus has been doing this. He's been doing this. He wants to walk with each of us. He wants to do life together with you. Sometimes our stories can get pretty messed up and take some very difficult terms and turns. And sometimes it's our fault and sometimes it's just a part of living in this world. Things we can't control. But I want to declare to you today that Easter is not just another Hallmark holiday with bunnies and chocolate. It isn't. It's not that. It's the celebration that with Jesus Christ, there is hope. And he wants to be, as I said before, not a stranger to any of us. He wants to be our best friend. He wants to be our forgiver. He wants to be our leader and our teacher. He wants to walk with every single one of us wherever we go. To steer us away from destructive choices so that we don't have to endure the consequences and to connect us with God forever so that that question never needs to be doubted. To give us hope and to give us courage and to give us everything we need to face the future. Because you see, with Jesus, the best is always yet to come. The best is always yet to come. Join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, today we thank you for sending Jesus into the world to show us your love. We thank you for uh, the story of your resurrection that, that we have in, in so many different places and, and the story of Cleopas and, and Mary as Jesus talked to them on the road and then revealed himself to them. I pray, God, this morning that maybe just as these men, this man and woman had, had, had saw Jesus for the first time with, with eyes wide open that today that we'll see Jesus maybe differently than we've ever seen him before. And that knowing that love that comes to us, God, that we'll open our hearts even more to receive him and to receive him as our Lord, as our, as our Savior, as our leader, as our forgiver, God will walk with him every single day. We say yes to you, Jesus, today. In your name we pray. Amen.